Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this video, we will quickly describe the major groups of both living and extinct Parasodactyla. These are the odd toed ungulates that today include rhinos, horses, and tapirs, but in the distant past included a vast array of interesting creatures that we will discuss quickly in this video. Now remember, parasodactyls are considered Laurasia therians. This is a massive clade of mammals that includes moles and bats and lions and horses and deer. And most molecular phylogenies recognize that parasodactyls and artiodactyls, which include whales and dolphins, the set artiodactyla, together form a branch of Laurasia therians onto themselves, and these are called the ungulata. Now, morphological phylogenies also support this branch because these mammals have hooves and walk on their toes. But once you start looking at the fossil record, there's an amazing variety of extinct creatures that appear to be ungulate or ungulate-like mammals, but don't fit easily into the parasodactyl, artiodactyl division of modern mammals. So in this video, we're going to look at this diversity of mammals, and in particular, look at the diversity of extinct parasodactyls. Now, as I've said before, a much better way of dividing ungulate mammals in the fossil record is whether they have the axis of the feet down the third metatarsal, the mesiaxic condition, or between the second and third metatarsal, the paraxic condition. Now, all the mammals that I will talk about in this video are mesiaxic, with the third metatarsal providing the bulk of the support uh, to the foot. Now, this includes many archaic ungulate mammals, the vast majority of which are extinct, and many of which are not true parasodactyls. Now, during the Paleocene, the mesiaxic condition is found in a group of mammals called Condylarthra, or Phenacodonta, which includes a successful sheep-sized mammal called Phenacodus. Phenacodus had a mesiaxic condition of the foot, but was digitigrade, and it had this long tail, and it was a moderate size herbivore and omnivore. There's also a couple other common phenacodontids in North America, including meniscotherium, which had more grinding-like teeth, and ectation. And one of the more important fossils in our discussions of ungulate evolution, Tetraclonodon, which had a more upright running stance, but is known from the Middle Paleocene. These archaic ungulates are older than the true parasodactyls that would arise at the start of the Eocene. These archaic ungulates made their way into South America during the early Paleocene, and down there, they evolved into a very diverse group of endemic ungulates, which are only known from the fossil record of South America. These ungulates are called the Meridio ungulata, which includes Leptopterans, these are horse-like and camel-like mammals. The noda ungulates, like Toxodon. The Typotherias, the primitive smaller sort of mammals. The rabbit-like Hegetiotherians. Uh, the star beasts, Astriopotheria. And the Xenungulates, which are close relatives to the North American Dinocerata. These included the horned and saber-toothed uintotheres. And lastly, the fire beasts, the pyrotheres. All these mammals exhibit a mesiaxic condition, but are not considered true parasodactyls. They're like the dead uncles and aunts to the group. Now, all of these mammals are New World mammals, living in North America or South America, and lived during the Paleocene, uh, with groups surviving into the Eocene in North America. 
But in South America, in isolation, they lived until the end of the last ice ages, around 11,000 years ago, with some groups even entering into North America with the Isthmus of Panama. But they are all extinct today. Now in Asia, there were also mesiaxic mammals living during the Paleocene, and they look and appear to be the direct ancestors of parasodactyls. Um, the dad and mom of the group. Now, one of the most interesting fossils is Radinskii, which is known from the Middle Paleocene of Asia, and which, which, which looks very taper-like, or more likely like a primitive isectolophid, which is a group of extinct parasodactyls that are known from the Eocene. Another intriguing early fossil group from Asia are the Cambaeotherus, which are have hooves, they also have a grooved distal facet on the astragalus and bulbous teeth and appear right near the origin of parasodactyls, but are early Eocene in age and they may form a new endemic group uh, located only in Asia of true parasodactyls. The first true parasodactyls appeared at the Paleocene-Eocene boundary 55.5 million years ago, and they invaded into North America and across Europe at this time with the possible origin in Asia. The earliest Eocene parasodactyls here in North America were the horses, Equidae, followed by the early taper-like Isectolophids, uh, then true tapers, Taperoididae, uh, Bronotheres, also called Titanotheres, and the Rhinoceroididae, the superfamily, which included a diverse group of rhinos. And by the early Middle Eocene, all of these groups were diverse and well represented in the fossil record. The last major group of parasodactyls to appear are the Calicotheridae, a group of bizarre clawed parasodactyls. Now, I've heard it pronounced Calicothere as well as Chalicothere, like the word chalice. Now I've been doing a little research on which way is the better pronunciation and consulted Ebenezer Bruner's 1887 book, Airs of Speech and Spelling, which gave a way to pronounce the word and it suggested Calicothere. Now, <laughs> I've also looked under the online Greek pronunciation tool and it suggested Kalelikathir. So I'm going to use Kalikathir because that's what I'm used to, but all of these uh, other pronunciations are equally correct and the word stems from the Greek for stone beast. The Kalikathirs were large browsing mammals with massive claws and horse-like faces. The best known is Moropus from the Miocene epoch. The Bronotheres, these large rhino-like mammals, some with two large horns on their skulls, were common during the middle to late Eocene, but went extinct at the start of the Oligocene. The horses, tapers, and rhinos survived across the Eocene-Oligocene boundary, but were not as diverse as the Earth's climate began to cool down. So four groups hung on through the boundary, the Calicotheridae, uh, surviving until the end Pliocene. All right, so to keep track of the extinct parasodactyls, we have three living groups, the horses, the tapers, and the rhinos. And there's three extinct groups, the Bronotheres, Calicotheres, and Isectolophids, and possibly a new Asian group, the Chambaeotheres. The Bronotheres and Calicotheres both appear toward the Middle Eocene, with Bronotheres possibly more closely related to horses, and Calicotheres possibly more closely related to tapers. The tapers and the rhinos together form a group called the ceratomorphs, although there is not strong molecular support. There is some support, uh, similar morphology between the two groups. The isectolophids are basal ceratomorphs, ancestral to probably both rhinos and tapers, and they kind of look like a, m a modern taper, but they lack the fleshy proboscis or trunk that modern tapers have. Fossil tapers are known in the early Middle Eocene, and they have a re reflected nasal opening 
indicating that very early on in their evolution, tapers had trunks, uh, likely modern taper, like modern tapers do. Um, tapers disappeared in North America around 10,000 years ago uh, with the appearance of humans, but have survived in the jungles of South America until the present. All right, you should be able to describe the major groups of both living and extinct Parasodactyla. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin slash Links are found in the description below.